Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 24? As Jesus was leaving the temple, his disciples came to him to point out to him the temple buildings. He answered them, you see all these, don't you? Truly I say to you, most certainly there will not be a stone left on a stone that is not thrown down. And when he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and asked, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. You are about to hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you're not alarmed. For it must be so, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these things are just the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will hand you over to tribulation and they will kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. And then all will be offended and betray one another and they will hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because lawlessness multiplies, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, with all the things going on in our minds and in our hearts, would you still us and calm us and prepare us to hear your word? We pray, Heavenly Father, that those things that you have caused to be written for our learning, for our encouragement, that we might live as your people in this time. We pray, Father, we might hear them by the power of your spirit, believe them, and live them out for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Friends, how have you handled this week? War in Ukraine, floods in Queensland and northern New South Wales, more reports of those bruised and battered in ministry. It's been a tough week. I was surprised early in the week to realise just how much the world news had been affecting my youngest. Um, She's in year 11, but she's been showing considerable signs of stress this week. And one of the things causing stress for her has been the threat of war on a scale that she has never seen in her lifetime. I remember as a younger man uh, reading passages like Matthew 24 And it all seems so abstract, so theoretical, so far in the future. I knew it was true, but I didn't have to worry about it just yet. Yet you could just about read our current world straight out of these verses, couldn't you? You might even be tempted to fill in the names, fill in the blanks, because it's all so real right now, isn't it? Plenty of saviour figures announcing they're the deliverer, They are the one to trust going into an uncertain future. War, not just in Ukraine, but in Central and Southern Africa and other places as well. Floods and climate change in general affecting crops in ways none of us can imagine. I heard this week that chocolate and coffee are on the world's endangered food lists. Now that's serious, isn't it? (laughs) And in Finland, the UK... And the US, and even in this country, Christians being taken to court by those determined to silence them. You will be hated by all the nations because of my name. Lawlessness proliferating and the love of many going cold. None of this sounds theoretical or hypothetical anymore, does it? None of it ever was, really. I just didn't know enough of what was going on around me. But we are warned about it all. In these very verses, in this part of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus warned his disciples about it all. And it was written down so that we could be warned about it all too. And threaded through these warnings 
at the beginning of Jesus' great Olivet Discourse, the last of the five great discourses in Matthew's Gospel, threaded through these warnings are four great encouragements, words designed to help us. The disciples may have just wanted to get the timetable before anybody else, but Jesus had another reason for telling them all of this and ensuring it was recorded for us. And though what he told them lay ahead was and is in many ways frightening, indeed terrifying, there's something brilliant in his words, something wonderfully comforting. So as we look a little closer at these words for just a few minutes this morning, keep an eye out, won't you, for those moments when Jesus goes beyond the description of the things to come to say something more directly to the disciples and to us. Well, the glorious temple in Jerusalem, rebuilt on a grand scale by King Herod the Great and finished just before Jesus was born, was magnificent. Like so many great architectural feats from the ancient world and even today, it was intended not only to serve a particular purpose, in this case the sacrifices required by Jewish law, but also to display the power and the grandeur of the one who built it, or at least commissioned it to be built. Herod spared little expense to make sure it was grand. It caught your eye as you neared the city. It might not have been one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, but it was close. Certainly, it impressed the disciples. The magnificent stones, the design, the colour, the spectacle. And Jesus said to them, in effect, don't get too attached. It won't last. And less than 40 years later, it was gone. All but one little wall, which you can still see today destroyed by the might of imperial Rome. You see all these things, don't you, Jesus said? You're impressed by them, aren't you? Well, don't let them distract you. They're not permanent. And there's Jesus' first encouragement to us. Don't be distracted. It is possible to become far too attached to things that will not last. And if that happens... When they're taken away from you, you'll be devastated. We can build impressive buildings, world-famous ministry infrastructure, and it can all come crumbling down in a moment. Don't get too attached. Don't let these things distract you. There is something that will last, but it's not these things. And so Jesus left the temple and the city down through the Kidron Valley, perhaps even through the Garden of Gethsemane and up the Mount of Olives. And that's when the disciples asked their question about the sign of Jesus coming and the completion of the age. And here comes the second encouragement, directed straight at the disciples and through them to us. Don't be deceived. Don't be distracted and don't be deceived. There'll be plenty of opportunity to be deceived Many people indeed will be deceived, but don't you be deceived. Many will present themselves as the Christ at last come. They'll set themselves up as authoritative teachers or the mouthpiece of God. How many cult leaders, do you think, have presented themselves as Jesus returned? I've lost count in my lifetime. And I'm sure I only know about the tip of the iceberg. You might have been expecting that the first great sign that Jesus would tell them about as they, as they were thinking about the end of the world would be something grand and spectacular, some cosmic phenomenon, a remarkable comet perhaps which would signal it's all about to happen. You might have expected something that would disrupt the patterns of life and make clear to everyone that the end was near. But instead Jesus talks about widespread deception by religious charlatans and frauds. And he warned, don't be deceived. Keep your eyes open and your antenna, antennae up. Watch out for those who want to draw out to follow them, others with fine sounding words and things that are really empty in the end. The promises of an easier life now, the, the promises of power now, perfection now. 
You're a child of the king. You deserve it all now. You're a daughter of the king. Live that princess life now. And they will deceive many. And then there are the non-religious saviours. The real deliverers who have come to show us a different way. In a world of confusion and dismay, deception is both easy and expected. So watch out that no one deceives you. You might think that you're safe. You've come to this college to be equipped for the future. You're not likely to be fooled by any imposter. But Jesus gives this encouragement because many people will be deceived. And that's why he says, don't be deceived. I've watched people being drawn into lies, half-truths, and the mischief of religious charlatans, even in this city, drawn into the orbit of enormous personalities who they come to believe can do no wrong, and they never even noticed the moment that that person became a new Christ to them. Don't be distracted. Don't be deceived. And the next one comes in verse 6. Did you notice? You're about to hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not alarmed. Don't be alarmed. And that's the word for the moment, isn't it? Of course, it's, it's been like it is since Jesus' ascension into heaven, and it will be like this until Jesus returns, one warmonger after another, one catastrophic descent into madness after another, the conquerors and the conquered, the victors and the victims. But just at the moment, this reality is heavily pressing in on us, isn't it? That normally buoyant, optimistic commentators and leaders have been talking this week about the real danger of nuclear weapons being employed. It's terrifying, isn't it? And in other places of the world, there might not be open warfare, but the threat of it is held over the heads of ordinary people, isn't it? In a world where the Prince of Peace is rejected and despised, it's going to be like that, isn't it? These things are a powerful demonstration that all is not well in the world. But they are not, strictly speaking, the end. It's necessary for these things to happen, Jesus said, but the end is not yet. As I said, my little girl, well, she's not that little anymore, but um, my little girl is alarmed. It terrifies her that we in this country might become embroiled in this war. She studied Hiroshima and Nagasaki at school, and she's seen the damage that an atomic bomb, let alone a nuclear bomb, can do. This week, her sisters actually asked me about the likelihood of conscription. Has it unsettled you this week? But it's not just war, is it? The disintegration of human society that Jesus was talking about will be accompanied or punctuated by natural disasters. Earthquake, famine, flood, tsunami, drought, wildfire. The world itself convulses while we convulse against each other. There will be times, and we've been here before, where it will be tempting to think it's all falling apart. It's all happening at once. We can't treat each other as human beings anymore. We can't speak without the threat of being misrepresented and dragged before the courts anymore. And then the earth twitches, the rivers break their banks in one place, record temperatures making life unbearable in others. It would be very easy to be alarmed. In fact, it's hard not to think that that's the only rational reaction to what's going on around us. But Jesus said, see to it that you're not alarmed. It's not the end, not yet. It's just the beginning of the birth pains. Jesus Warning and encouragement is an incredibly kind gift to make clear to us that life is going to be like this in our broken world. Don't be surprised and don't be alarmed. Anyone who promises you something different is trying to deceive you. 
Jesus has known about it from the beginning. It's not caught him by surprise. It might look like things are falling apart and the centre cannot hold, but it's only the beginning. Don't be distracted by things that will not last. Don't be deceived by those who claim to be our deliverer. Don't be alarmed by disasters all around us, the world convulsing around us and us convulsing against each other. They're the first three encouragements. But before we get to the fourth, notice the shift that takes place in Jesus' words. Up to now, these things are experienced by everyone. The deceivers are out in the open trying to deceive everybody. The wars and rumours of wars are on the evening news. They are public events impacting everyone. The famines and the earthquakes affect rich and poor, old and young, men and women, those living in the north and those living in the south. This is life in the world. But then Jesus turns his attention to what Christians might expect in the days to come the normal Christian life in the last days. And though we have not experienced this in our country at this moment, at least not in the severity Jesus spoke about that day, for many Christians in other places, this too is a reality now. And it may not be too far away from us either. It's not a rosy picture, is it? It's not a description drawn up by the marketing department. Or if you'd if it was, you'd want to sack them, wouldn't you? I mean, you look at this list from verse 9 and you might wonder why anybody would want to become a Christian. Being betrayed, persecution, death, hatred, manufactured offence, backbiting, infighting, false teaching, and drift, worldliness and backsliding. None of that is inviting. Some of it will be out in the open. Some of it will be unnoticed by those on the outside. The love of many will grow cold. It's tempting to look at the decline of the mainstream denominations in the West and fit them into this frame. And I'm not sure it would be entirely wrong to do that. The Anglican communion worldwide has been full of betrayal, persecution, manufactured offence, backbiting, false teaching and the rest. So has the Roman Catholic Church. And don't worry, the other denominations and groups are not far behind. Church splits, scandals, worldliness on a breathtaking scale. It's all happening right now. As I said, this is the normal Christian life in the last days. And that's when the last encouragement comes and it's double barreled. Do you see it there in verse 13? But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Why is it worth persevering? Enduring despite this dark picture of hate and betrayal and persecution and even death. Because what is held out at the end is so good. The one who endures to the end will be saved. It's worth it. The end is worth it. The salvation that Jesus has won for us is so rich and full and exciting that it is worth it. The Apostle Paul would put it this way, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Keep going, keep enduring, because the frightening world events are not the end, nor are the natural disasters, nor even the persecution of Christians, both inside and outside the churches. And there's the other barrel. While all of this is happening, God's eternal plan to call out a people for himself through the proclamation of the gospel goes on unabated. God is still on the throne. He has not been for one moment disengaged with his world. And God's purpose and plan is still on track. And the end will not come. It cannot come until this gospel is proclaimed to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Get ready, don't be surprised. The things spoken of in the opening of this last great speech of Jesus might look terrifying, and we are beginning to see them played out around us. 
but God's great plan remains in place and the end is worth it. It is so thoroughly and completely worth it. The one who endures to the end will be saved. So don't be distracted by things that will not last. No matter how big and impressive they might seem, they're not permanent. And don't be deceived by those who claim to be our deliverer. Whether they're religious or secular, they'll gather many followers, but it's still a charade. Don't be alarmed by disasters all around us. The world convulsing around us and us convulsing against each other. It's real and terrifying, but it simply has not conquered God or derailed his purpose. And endure to the end, because what God do, is doing is worth it. The gospel will be preached to all the nations on the earth, and you will be saved. That's what Jesus told his disciples when they wondered all about the temple and asked about the timetable of the end. And that's what Jesus wants you and me to know this morning. So will you pray with me? Our Father, as we look at our world, we acknowledge that there's so much that would be easy for us uh, to despair about and lead us into a deep depression. But you, Lord God, sit on your throne. You have not lost control for a moment and you are working out your purpose. So as we hear these encouragements from the mouth of Jesus this morning, we pray that you might give us that strength and endurance, that resilience and that joy to hold out to the end, which is so thoroughly worth it. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.